Hi, I'm Wild Bill, a political affairs correspondent for Redbeard Pirate Radio, which is a product of my creation. And today, uh, I've watched a very interesting video talking about the Japanese Self-Defense Force, especially the Maritime. And it led me to think about Japan's problem in terms of her position uh, geographically speaking and also uh, the political climate in the seas around her, what the needs are of the various nations involved, because there are quite a few nations that are, that are very, very interested in who gets to use the fisheries, the South China Sea as we call it, some of the most productive fishing zones in the world, and there are several very powerful nations that want it and don't want anyone else to have it. It's an ongoing war between Oh, it's been an ongoing war over fisheries between uh, Japan and the Philippines, Japan and uh, China, China and the Philippines, uh, China and Vietnam, uh, China and India. Uh, India eats a lot of fish too. So the problem being, of course, that uh, each nation perceives its right to have all of it. And then if there's some left over here, you could have it. That's okay. You know, sell it to your profit. That's unhealthy for everybody. It's very friendly for the nation that's doing it, but it's not friendly for anybody else. It causes the world to live in a great deal of anxiety, unhappiness, just because one group of people is getting over. And uh, the idea of government, of course, is to smooth that out so that nobody's being gotten over on too much. Everybody's being gotten over on a little bit. If you don't know what I'm talking about, study political science. It is the if there's art in it, it is the art of making sure that everybody's unhappy about the same amount. So they can't get together, get together in a bar somewhere and talk about how crummy you are because they didn't get a fair shake and everybody else did. That's where dissent turns into opposition. <clears throat> but I wanted to talk about Japan's uh, geopolitical, geophysical position and the problem, the conundrum faced with her uh, very natural worries about the other nations in her vicinity and their interests in areas that are that the Japanese consider traditionally their own or that may be legally Japanese purview, but also areas including the Straits of Taiwan and the Philippine Sea uh, and of course the South China Sea and the China Sea. Um, Bay of Bengal. These are places that have tremendously productive fisheries and the Japanese are very interested in them as are the Australians, as are the Indonesians, as are China and India and uh, Bangladesh. So this is what I have to say about it, worrying or wondering myself what problem Japan is facing with her marine self-defense force, her warships and her naval aircraft and patrol uh, forces. As warships and fixed and rotary wing military assets are extremely pricey items, giving the lie to one of the basic tenets of capitalism, that competition between near-peer business empires results in lower costs for the consumer, how effectively can Japan use a navy to protect itself? She won't be able to build a fleet of large warship hulls. It's too expensive. In Japan's specific case, external routes of communications for supplies and strategic movement of men and material are crucial to any government's response to large-scale disaster, enemy invasion, or protection of critical fisheries. In times past, communications were not so advanced, but more of any given type of ship could be built for the same national investment in time and labor. Flotillas or task groups could be detailed to defend, deter, or intercept without dispersing strategic assets like Kido Butai from their best usage, operational level mass strikes and covering amphibious landings. Today's ships are individually quite capable, but less able to react generically to multiple simultaneous threats, unless these are all of the same type, i.e. anti-ship missiles or torpedoes or ballistic bombardment, one or the other, not any two or three. Today, we have highly specialized hulls whose functions are parsed to closer tolerance than of old. They don't overlap like they once did. As they are extremely expensive, too, this raises the questions, how many is enough 
and can we afford that many? In Japan's case, I wonder. There's a lot of coastline to patrol and difficult inter interior communications um, for materiel, not telecommunication, due to terrain. Covering all the coast at once seems like a pretty tough problem when budgets are parsimonious. Land-based air can't do it all. Surface and subsurface ships are necessary too, and small ships won't do the job against big seas. A carrier can ride out a storm capable of capsizing smaller ships. Now, the Japanese have four aircraft carriers at this time. They call them uh, aviation destroyers. And four carriers is nice, but won't at least one be in dry dock, refit, or refurbishment at any given moment? So a maximum of three formations, because the carrier is the center of formation, to cover the eightfold corners of the Japanese isles, the home islands. Now, subs are nice, but have weather and sea state limitations. Carriers are sexy AF, but have vulnerabilities, including to weather and sea state in regards to flight offs. 4,000 ton frigates and 8,000 ton destroyers are big and tough, but they have stabilization issues in rotten weather and seas. And all ex-sailors remember that the weather is a fickle friend at best. No one type can do it all. That means we need a large integrated system composed of dozens of hulls over four or five basic specialized types, times the number of groups we need for full coverage, remembering that one of those groups will be in dry dock when you need it most. Can Japan afford that? Can she afford that and a high standard of living? And keep enough capital free for big ticket, high profile aid to other nations in need? Uh, projecting the flag is done for a reason, after all, to make friends and influence people in ways short of war. Wild Bill.